Uh, it says Nasso. It's Korach. Okay, let's begin like this. We're going to discuss the, the machlokas between Korach and, the, and Moshe. What was going on there? What was the intention? Where was that going? And what can we learn from the machlokas that Korach created, the controversy that he created? What can we learn in our own lives about that? Um, we'll learn several different perspectives, Bezrat Hashem, today on that. The first comes from Pirkei Avos. This is a very oft-quoted Mishnah for the week of Parshish Korach. And we learn the following. In the Mishnah, this is 517, but in some Pirkei Avos, it's 520. Depends on the, the counting or the numbering in your Pirkei Avos. The Mishnah says the following. Komach loke shehi l'shem shamayim. So for the Iskayim, which literally means any machlokas that is l'shem shamayim, that is the, it's meant for the sake of heaven, so for the Iskayim, that it's going to endure forever because the machlokas, the two people that are arguing, are not doing it for their own sake, but they're doing it for the sake of shamayim. Therefore, that machlokas will endure. And we could think of other, you know, there are serious, you know, arguments that have been gone on through our history that were, that were sincere that were serious, that were based on sources. And the two individuals, the two parties, were Yari Shemaim, or God-fearing people. And the Mishnah says that machlokas will last. That machlokas will last. The she'en of L'shem Shemaim, but a, a machlokas that is for the, their, the individuals involved, right? It's for them, but not for, it's not, it doesn't have Hashem's in mind. Ain't so for this time, it's never going to last. So, what is an example of machlokas, like shem shemayim, that is for the sake of heaven, that the two parties involved aren't looking to deride or to mock or to make fun or knock down one, the opposition. It's, there's no opposition at all. It's just two people trying to find out the emits of Torah. Who is that? That's a machlokas between Hillel and Shama. Hillel and Shama. There they argue and debate all the time. Yet the Gemara says in Erevin that that didn't deter the two of them from their children marrying one another. They didn't hate each other, but they had different opposing views in terms of how to understand the Torah itself. That's a machlokas hilo v'shamay. That's a machlokas l'shem shamayim. V'she'en a l'shem shamayim, but a machlokas that's not l'shem shamayim, zu machlokas korach v'chol adaso. That's a machlokas of korach and his entire and his band of 250 people. Now, if you look at this Mishnah, right, what many people point out, many Mepharshim point out in this Mishnah, is that Hillel, it's Hillel versus Shammai. They disagreed. They, they disagreed. The fact, actually, it's interesting, the reason why we pass and we follow the opinion of Hillel is because Hillel, the Gemara says, always thought about Shammai's opinion first. He factored it in and said, oh, yeah, that's his, I look at this a different way. He, he considered it um, and then went a different route. As opposed to Machlokas Korach Vadaso, it does not, the Mishnah does not say who Korach is arguing with. All the Mishnah says is Korach and his Aida, meaning it wasn't about who they were arguing with. What they were debating was something selfish, really it was self centered. It wasn't that Korach had an actual debate. Maybe he made reasons and things that sounded logical to him or to other people, but ultimately it was all about himself. It was completely selfish, not selfless, but selfish. And that's where Korach stands. Vayikach Korach, it doesn't say what Korach took, but Korach was just a taker. He was all about himself. He was motivated by his self-glorification. Uh, Rizzo Salanter has a very beautiful, I would say he's not Hasidish, but a Hasidish Pshat on this Mishnah. He says, what are the most difficult machlokos? What are the ones that really rip apart communities destroy families, um, you know, break apart friendships. Those are, right, no one wakes up one day, Rosalanter, Rousseau points out, no one wakes up one day and says, you know what, today I'm going to, you know, declare an opinion. I'm going to de declare a machlokas against somebody else. And that's going to kind of create a riff and split and break apart and tear apart an entire community. No one wakes up, no most people aren't motivated from there. But yet most machlokos that end up do, do doing that, they all start from the same point. They all start l'shem shamayim. Everybody, right, thinks 
that they're doing the right thing. L'shem Shamayim here, he reinterprets it as, I think I'm doing the right thing, and Yenem, and the other guy thinks they are doing the right thing. Whenever people dig into their opinion so much to the extent that they feel that what I am doing is that is something that will never that will last and endure forever. It will endure forever because the two individuals, the two parties involved, are not looking at this objectively. They are looking at based on their own, and they're blinded and bribed, he says, by their own benefits of their own opinions. Therefore, they convince themselves that their position is indeed correct. And that is the most dangerous of all. The most dangerous opinions of all is somebody that refuses to look at their opinion in an objective manner and refuses to say or to admit that maybe, just maybe, they did something wrong. And sensibly, a machlokas, where l'shem shamayim is involved, right, where someone says, I'm doing this for the sake of heaven, that could, you know, that could take a really wrong turn and can cause serious damage um, for the future. That's the first thought. Yes, man. Rabbi. Yeah. So we see Korah comes right after Shalach, but in terms of a timeline, is it actually immediately after the incident with the Maraglim? And if so, if it does, did Cora kind of play on that, knowing that, first of all, anyone over 20 was not going into Eretz Yisrael. This would be a time to try to, to, uh, to, bring, to bring a cool. Mandy, Mandy, I'm going to stop you mid-sentence. I hope that's okay with you, because that's, that's next thought. That's the next word right here, okay? Okay. Uh, Mandy and I did not plan this, but this is perfect. Robert Zion Fierer, who was a Rav in Eretz Yisrael for many years, um, he has a he, accomplished author, wrote many, many svarim. I believe Rabbi Weintraub on the line is a fan of his svarim. Uh, he writes the following. He says, look at the structure, look at the, where was Korach placed? When did Korach happen? It happens to be a big machlokas as to when the, the exact moment in time when Korach took place. Did it take place before the Meraglim, after the Meraglim? Did it take place in year two, immediately afterwards, or many years later? It's unclear exactly when Korach took place. Yet, he says the following, I'll be shot of the Pesukim. Ata acharei maisa maraglim. After the maisa maraglim, where what happened to maraglim, this Amendi just pointed out, they're not allowed to go in. They're not allowed to go in. So what do they do, right, during those next 38 years? They're in the Midbar. They're stuck. They can't go anywhere, right? They can't do anything. What happens now? What happens now? So he says that the job of the Jewish people during that time was to make something of their time, to make something of the time that they had in the Midbar. So you're right, many, many people were seeing a learning Torah, right? If you think of Korach, Korach was a very small fraction of the Jewish people. Many people were sitting and learning, um, connecting with family, using this time very appropriately. But But for some people, when there is just what we call dead time, there is nothing for somebody to do what does a person do during that time? Osehu machlokas. That's the perfect time for machlokas to seep in. Kishelohaya korach malasos. Korach had nothing to do, right? He had this, this, this thing didn't bother him. It bothered him for a very long time. But now, oh, there's nothing going on. Let's make the news. Kishelohaya korach malasos halach v'asa machlokas. Then he got up and began machlokas. Right? This is what happens. He says, when people don't have something to do, when there's no structure, when there's no order, when there's no sense of what's going, what's happening next, when there is dead time, so that is the avoda of making something with our time, using it positively. Korach said, dead time, what are we going to do? And he used it horrifically. He used it horribly and created um, derision and divide amongst the Jewish people. And this is why Korach comes immediately after Meraglim, because that's what can happen. Not because of hate Meraglim per se, but as a result of nothing. It's a summer right now. What are we doing in the summer, right? What are we doing? It's a big, it's a big challenge for people with children. Many of the camps are canceled. And even if uh, your camp wasn't canceled, many 
children or parents do not feel comfortable attending those camps, what are kids going to do during this time? It is not so simple. And it's not only machlokas, but a lot of negative things can happen as a result of this empty time. On the same, I'd say on the flip side, um, empty time, empty space creates opportunities for exploration. It creates opportunities for creativity and connection. It's all what we do with our time. It's our choice, how we use and utilize our time. That is thought number two. Rabbi? Yes. Did Jules. he make it? Did he make an effort to get Dustin Aviram and the 250? Did they automatically come to him? Uh, it seems those... like they were enamored by him. They were enamored. Okay. He had a soapbox, and they, they were so, enamored by him. Yeah. So he drew a, he drew a crowd. He drew a crowd. He drew a crowd. Yeah, yeah he's very, very convincing. Very convincing guy. Okay. Third idea comes from, again, we're trying to quote different Divrei Torah from Rabbi Lamb. Rabbi Lamb here quotes a famous, a well-known piece from the Arizal. I don't have it on here, but he quotes the Arizal. The Arizal writes the following, that Moshe and Korach, their debate goes back way earlier in history. Their earlier um, traces of their machlokas. And in fact, the neshamos of Moshe and Korach correspond to the neshamos of, anyone know? Anyone heard this before? Yes, yes. Uh, Kevel, the high, uh, uh, Kevel and uh, his brother. Kain and Hevel, Hevel. exactly. Yeah. So to Kain and Hevel, right? Just to review, very first part in the Torah in the beginning of time, Kain got jealous of Hevel and killed him. Right, so Moshe is Hevel, and Korach, the antagonist, is Kayin. And he says that's what the that's what the Arizal writes. The Arizal has a sefer called Shar Gilgulim, where he writes all the all of the Gilgulim in uh, the Torah in Tanakh, and he be, he says that Korach is Hevel and Kayin and Ko, uh, Moshe is Hevel and Korach is Kayin. Now he says, what? How do we see this? He has two questions. How do we see the similarity here? That's number one. And number two, the results of the story are the inverse or the opposite. Moshe beats out Korach, right? Korach ultimately is swallowed up by the ground and Moshe wins. In the story of Cain and Hevel, what happens? The opposite. Hevel gets swallowed up in the ground, right? He dies. And and the blood of his, you know, the blood of Hevel gets swallowed up into the ground. So what is, why is this? What's the similarities? And why is there that one major difference at the end? So he writes here that there's three elements that are similar. Number one is kinah. There is jealousy, right? The fratricide committed by Cain against Hevel had its roots because Cain was envious. He was jealous of Hevel. And that is also true with Moshe and Korach. Moshe and Korach were both children that stemmed from the tribe of Levi. Yet Moshe was the undisputed leader of Klal Yisrael, and Korach wasn't. It was the fires of jealousy that consumed Korach over Moshe, that Midah of Kinah. Number two is the Midah of Taiva, of desire, a ravenous ap- appetite for more and more. In the story of the sons of, sons of Adam, the Chazal tell us that they divided the world between the two of them. Cain owned half the world, and his brother had the other half. Cain desired, right? They had the same amount, but he desired more. He wanted more uh, than what he had. Korach additionally, right? Korach additionally was extremely wealthy. Chazal say he was... Levium were, were prominent people. They were wealthy. Korach was it, but he was not satisfied with that. He wanted more power. He wanted more. He desired more and more and more. Thirdly, the third similarity is covered. Honor and recognition, right? More than envy or desire, right? What motivated Cain to this tragic act? It was the covered. After all, Hashem accepted the Korban of Hevel, 
and he did not accept the korban of Cain. So that could be understood as, as, as jealousy, but also as kavod. He wanted that honor from a Kaddish Baruch Hu. He wanted that recognition from a Kaddish Baruch Hu. And Korach had everything. He was a Levi, right? He was already a higher status than everybody else. He was wealthy. Yet more than that, he desired the kavod, the honor that Moshe was afforded as being Moshe Rabbeinu, the leader of Klal Yisrael, right? And this is why the Mishnah tells us, if it's these three elements that Korach had, what does the Mishnah tell us? Kina taiva of the kavod, the kina taiva of the kavod, jealousy, desire, and kavod, and honor, remove motzian as adam and olam. They remove a person from this world. That's exactly what happened in the case of Korach. What happened? Korach literally was removed from the world. Literally was sent to egg, right? He was literally removed from the world. Cain also. He wasn't, he wasn't killed by Hashem. But what was he done? He was sent into exile. He was removed from his own world. So we see how these three midos, these three character traits, midos ro'os, I would say, are, are dangerous and can cause disaster and calamity to an individual if one holds on to them. Right? And that's a similarity between these two stories. Right? Yet, um, this is now, this is great. This is, now this is Rabbi Lam. That's one idea. Now Rabbi Lam adds to this. Why was, why in the parallel are, do they not fit? Korach loses, but Kayin, his counterpart, wins. So he says, you have to look at the story. If you look at the story, both of them have a hanging or dangling modifier. In both stories, they both begin a verb, but then don't act upon it, right? Kayin, um, they're in the field, right? Kayin, and then the, the Torah says in Parshish Barashas, Cain said to his brother, and then he went and killed him. The Torah never tells us what Cain said to his brother. It just says that Cain said to his brother. That's where, that's where we have a whole debate in the Midrashim as to what they were arguing about. Was it about the land? Was it about the food? Was it about you know, a wife? It's not so clear. But that's number one. By Korach, you have the same idea. Right? You have a verb, and it's this hanging, and there's no explanation of what was going on. Korach Torah says, Vayikach Korach. Korach took. What did Korach take? The Torah never says. Right? What or whom did he take? We are never told. Rabbi Lamb says that's the deeper similarity here. Because ultimately, why does the Torah never tell us what Kayan said or Korach took? Because it was irrelevant. Because the motivations of the two of them were so horrible, were so personal, so subjective, and was therefore what they said or what they ultimately took was inconsequential because what they ultimately wanted to do was to satisfy their desire for power, their desire for money, and their desire for honor and their jealousy over somebody else. Therefore, it was irrelevant what they said. But why does Cain become, why does Hevel become the victim? in that story, but later on, Moshe becomes the victor. Why would that be? Anyone want to suggest an answer? Could it be a beautiful. Tikkun? What? Could it be a tikkun? It could be a tikkun. So what's the tikkun? What did Moshe learn from Hevel that he was able to do this? this is, I think this is brilliant. He says, when it comes to Hevel, Hevel never, never objected to what Cain did. Cain spoke. He made a claim against Hevel. We don't know what it is. It's irrelevant. But he made a claim. Hevel never responded to that. He never acknowledged it for what it was. He didn't call his bluff. He didn't say you're lying. He didn't say, come on, you have half, I have half. What are you talking about? You're being jealous. You're being... He never called it out for what it was. And when we don't call out, he writes, Rabbi Lamb writes, if we don't call out Sheker for what it is, then the Sheker right, lingers. It stays. And very often in that situation, good people end up losing. They're good people. They're great people. They're special people. They have good meat. They end up losing. Sometimes good people have to take a stand. Whereas by Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe recognized here that he couldn't let this pass. He had to make a statement. He had to get up and say they are wrong. He had to call in Dustin and Avivah. He had to invoke 
um, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, over here. And there had to be intervention. And he had to call it out for what it was. Because if you don't call it out <clears throat> for what it is, when there's a challenge to leadership, then that lingers. The shikaris lingers. And the more that it lingers, the more dangerous it can become. And that's what Rabbi Lamb says here beautifully, putting together an enigmatic statement of the Arizal and making it so beautiful for all of us. That is, that was really two ideas, but we'll keep it as one. And then um, number four and five over here, we're going to take a step back. If I had to ask anybody here, what's the name of the Parsha? What's the name of the Parsha? This is not a, Korach, no? Okay, thank you, Claire. It's Korach. The Parsha is called Korach. What are you telling me? What do you even, it says it on your sources, Rabbi Markowitz. The Parsha's name is Korach. Get out of here. So many Mepharshim are bothered by this. They're bothered by this. And I have a safer at home, which I got this past year, which is unbelievable. It's called Otzer Plosa Torah. And in there, in the first piece on Parsha's Korach, he writes the following. He quotes in Or Moshe. He quotes Svarim that it really, I don't have, I haven't had access to it. I quote the, the Or Moshe, who writes the following. Rechaim Pelagi was a great Sephardi posseg, the Kaf Chaim. He never called, the Kaf Chaim, Rechaim Pelagi never, doesn't call our Parsha Korach. He calls it Ben Levi. Others call it Ben Kehas. They did not call the Parsha, right? Near the, the Farish Pshat HaMedrash Biraba B'Shem, Parsha's Ben Levi. They called the Parsha Ben Levi. Isn't that, isn't that a good night towards Levi? So why, okay, good question, Mandy. Why would they call the Parsha, why wouldn't they call the Parsha Korach? What a horrible role model. Horrible role model. So I'll ask it in a different way. But we also, we also had Balak. We call it, call it Parsha Balak. Oh, okay, so... Korach sends in that participate. There's a matter of fact, the the uh, 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 the Tehillim, they, 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 they're in, they have their own, they have their own uh, Tefillos, and Tehillim, uh, you see Bnei Korach, and, uh, yeah. and uh, therefore it would be Doche, to 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 uh, to say to conclude, you say Korach. You were thinking of the prodigy of Korach. Yeah. So yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. But also, what Milty was saying is a good point. I think what Milty's really asking is, Korach's a bad guy. So why are we naming a parasha after a bad guy? And right. Milty's then second follow up question, which we'll have to get to in, in next week, because uh, next week's a double parsha is what about Bala? But parsha's coming so. Yeah. How do the names of the Pashios, uh how do they get named? Who names them? Divinely? Uh, it's from uh, Mesora. They a man, a, a, a man did it. I mean, Moshe. I mean, who, who, who's, where does it come from? Yeah. Uh, probably I thought sometime the rabbis in Tiberius did it. No? It's probably in the time, times of the Tanayim it happened, because that's when we had oh. the, in Bavel, we only we laid the Parsha. In Yerushalayim, we, in Eretz Israel, we laid uh, we only finished the Torah every three, you know, every three years. So they but didn't have the parsha that we had. They didn't in have Bavel. them. In in Bavel, Bavel they, they, in Bavel, they finished the parshas once a year. So probably in the, in the times of Bavel, in uh, in the times of Tanayim, that's when this was developed. So the, ra- the rabbis did it. Yeah, yeah. So the so Lubavitch oh, so is terrible. bothered by this question. He's bothered by this question. Now, Bechir of Emilas Korach, Kishma Shaparshin of the Reshes Beer. Why would we call the Parsha Korach? He's a, he's a Russia. He's a Russia, right? Why would we call the Parsha Parsha Korach? He's a Russia. And number two, he says, call Vayikach. We should call it after the first, pers- first word in the Parsha. The first word in the Parsha is Vayikach. That's not such, that's not such a great question because Vayikach, um, we have a lot of Parshas that are not after, you know, Vayikach. You know, so he says the following. He says there was a, we're, we named the parsha after Korach because there's a Mida of Korach. There's something that Korach did that we want to emulate. There's something that he did that's special 
that we want to copy. That is, that we want to copy. And this is the, uh, the greatness of Lubavitcher Rebbe because he takes something and flips it on his head. That's what he always does. He always spins things in a positive way. He said he reframes, and it's so beautiful. He says like this, Machlokas korach madaso, niva mishiva so shal korach liyos kohen gadol. The whole machlokas comes from the fact that korach desired, deeply desired to be the kohen gadol. And he says, ultimately, that was absolutely wrong. It's absolutely wrong. God chooses who the kohen gadol is, and korach is not God, so korach can't choose that. But, and that's where it came from. And that's a psul, a major psul and flaw in Korach's thinking and his logic and the way that he approached this entire question. Yet, deep down, Larebi says, there was something beautiful about what Korach really wanted. Korach desired more. Korach had a deep desire and ratzon to get close to Hashem. He really wanted this, he had a desire to get really close to Kaddish Baruch Hu, and he saw no bounds in terms of that. He wanted to get there regardless of how, where, and who. And Rabbi. that, one second, we can't choose. I'm Yisrael, I can't go into the Heichal in the Beis HaMikdash. It just can't happen, right? It just, it's just not allowed. I can't bring a Korban today because we don't, have, we don't yet have a Beis HaMikdash. It doesn't happen. But so that, we, we have rules and we have regulations. And yet he says, deep down, there is a Mida, right? There's something that we should learn and can learn from Korach, and that is the desire to grow desire to have more, to have a deeper and greater and more profound relationship with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. And that's why he says, ultimately, and this maybe is the Machlokas here, Kafa Chaim says, get out of here. We're not going to name the parsha after Russia. That's ridiculous. Whereas the Rebbe says, no, and the Messorah is not that way because there's something positive about Korach. There's something positive about every person. I think that's really what the Rebbe said is, there's something we can learn from everybody. Everybody could teach us something and Korach teaches us that we can be greater, we can learn more, and we can always, we should always desire to be, to do more. Okay, with that, uh, we, I think Jules has a question. I wish everybody a great Shabbos. It should be a great week. And Boaz Hashem, it's great to see everybody first week of Shachash Binyanim. Looking forward to Kriyasa Torah. Rabbi. Rabbi, can you say...